symbols and images explained. We're going to start by Revelation 13. Then we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7 and end on Daniel chapter 2. Revelation chapter 13. Um, I, I don't know what um, version or translation this is, but we'll read it. It should be generally the same in all translations. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. This is John speaking. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns were ten crowns. And on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So you got the three animals there so far. A leopard, a bear, and a lion. That's important. So underline those three. Bear, leopard, and lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So this beast at this point seems to indicate a person because he's given personal pronouns. He is he and so forth. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Let's start right at the end. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Yeah. So again, we're speaking about the book of Revelation. Revelation takes place over a seven-year period. Remember, seven from uh, Revelation chapter 6 onwards, it's a seven-year period. So if it talks about three and a half, we know that's half of that seven-year period. So the beast, I'll give a little bit of clarity to this before we carry on. It will hopefully be cemented as we go down. But the beast represents two things in Revelation 13. Number one is it's a person, and it represents the Antichrist. So somewhere on your page, write beast equals antichrist he's given personal pronouns he's he speaks so it's this image of the beast the bear and the lion it's an image and a symbol of the antichrist okay so that's number one and it says that he will uh, speak great things and people around the world will say who is like the beast who is like this guy who can make war against him he's so perfect he's so he's so beautiful and handsome and he's like tom cruise on a good day <laughs> What are you using, putting your thumb down for Don Cruise for? Um, so he speaks his great blasphemous things. And he's given reign over 42 months, which is three and a half years. I think we did touch on this in our last maybe two lessons. Is that the Antichrist will reign for seven years. The first three and a half will be relatively peaceful. That's kind of the idea. He comes forward, he makes peace between Israel and the Palestinians, between the Arab nations and Israel. And everyone's very happy. And Israel says, yeah, for the first time we've got peace and safety in our land. Never happened before. And then halfway through that seven years of tribulation, he unveils his true colors. And he wages an all-out war. He brings all the nations together. Last week's lesson, Turkey, Libya, Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, Persia, all the countries, he uh, aligns them together and he starts to invade Israel, which ends in the battle of Armageddon. All right. So the first three and a half years, relatively peaceful. And then he wages an onslaught against Israel. And this is the beast that we're talking about here. So that the last 42 is when he reveals his true, the, the last three and a half years, he reveals his true colors and he becomes the Antichrist. Uh, anyone want to give a two cents worth on who the dragon is? Satan. Satan. And how do you know that? Well said. In Re you can write somewhere on that page next to it, Revelation chapter 12. And it states very specifically that the dragon is the devil. That old serpent of old. So we know that the dragon is the devil. We know that the beast is the Antichrist. So the idea is that the, uh, the dragon, the devil, will give authority and power to the Antichrist to reign. The Antichrist will be a political, military, even a pseudo-religious leader that people will marvel at. 
So you can take, there's not many political leaders out there that we can marvel at today, but just, I always like JFK, all right? <laughs> so let's take a JFK, for example, and, and make it like a guy like that, very charismatic. The people look at him, uh, women are in awe of him, uh, men want to be like him. It's kind of like a, that idea, all right? So you'll be a guy that will come up in the political scene, make peace, and everybody will say, wow, this guy is awesome. All right, so now that we've got a bit of understanding, um, I just need to add to that I did say there were two things. This beast represents the Antichrist. That's clear from the passage because it says he and he and he. But it also represents something else. And for that, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 17. So we're touching on Revelation 13 now. We read all about this beast and the lion and the leopard and blah, blah, blah. We are fortunate that John actually does give us a little bit of an interpretation of what this beast is about. Revelation chapter 13. No, no, 17, 17. Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17. Okay, and then we're going to look at verse 9 to maybe 12. Let's read a couple of verses. So John in Revelation 17 gives us um, the interpretation of what this beast is with the seven heads. He says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. Good luck. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm sure we guys all have a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven gills on which the woman sits. We're not going to get into the woman now. We're going to just talk about the seven heads. They are also seven kings. So the seven heads on that beast that we just read about in Revelation 13, those seven heads represent seven kings or kingdoms. It says five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. At the time John was writing this, the empire that was in play was the Roman Empire. So it says one is, that is the Roman Empire. The five that are fallen are those before the Roman Empire, the Grecians, Babylonians, Persians. And then it says, one is yet to come. This is the future empire. And then he says, when he does come, he will remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not, he is the eighth. So the Antichrist will come and he'll set up his eighth kingdom. And he belongs to the seven. So out of these seven kingdoms, he will birth his kingdom. All we're doing is reading it for now. We're not going to get into too much detail about this one yet. And then verse 12 says, the ten horns you saw are ten kings. So the seven heads represent seven kingdoms. The ten horns represent ten kingdoms. All right. So as I said, the beast that comes out of this, the sea in, in Revelation 13, the one part is definitely the Antichrist because it talks of a person, he that has blasphemous names, and the other side of the beast is kingdoms. So on the page, you said the beast equals Antichrist. Next to that or underneath that, also write, equals kingdoms of the earth because John already interpreted for us all right so and that's important to understand because we mustn't uh, not know that we can't just say this beast is just kingdoms and we can't just say it's the antichrist it's a mixture of both all right no questions yet that you guys are so good man <laughs> As I said, we're not going to get into too much detail of Revelation 13 itself. We're going to explain that by looking at the prophecies of Daniel. It says on your lesson, in order to understand Revelation 13, we will consider Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. So right at the bottom of the page, one, it says the four beasts of Daniel. Daniel had a dream, vision depicting the empires as predatorial beasts. Let's read about this vision in Daniel chapter 7. So as I said, we're reading from the lesson, but what you can do as homework is go and read the same verses in your Bible, in your translation, whether it be King James, NIV. All right, and this is what it says. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. Do you get that first one? Underline lion. 
The second beast was like a bear, underlined bear. Do you see how that fits in with Revelation 13? Revelation 13 talks about the same animals. And it says this bear was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus do it. I assume this is then the King James. Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and there was another, like a leopard, underline leopard. And on his back had four wings of a bird. So we got already three of those animals that John speaks about in Revelation 13. It says the beast, over the page, also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So Daniel has a vision of four animals. He gives some details to how they look. Four wings and three ribs. Uh, the last one had four heads. And then he says, And this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. So he sees a fourth animal also come in his visions. Dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. He does not give a description to this one. The other ones, he says, is a bear, a lion, and a, is it a leopard? Uh, but this one, yes, a leopard. And this one, he doesn't give any animal description. He just says it's dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. And it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts before it. And it had ten horns. All right. So we just spoke about the ten kings and the, the horns from Revelation 13 and 17. Those same ten kings is the same ten horns that Daniel is speaking about. And he also speaks about those same animals. So what some people say is, John, when he was writing his revelation in 90 AD, just copied some of the stuff from Daniel. That's not true. These things were written about 600 years apart from each other, different times, different places, and different revelations. If John wanted to copy Daniel, he would have copied him more correctly than that. You would have said it like Daniel said it. But John's revelation is a completely different beast with the same animals. Do you see that? All right. So now, and we find that in Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to read from 15. So he has a vision and a dream of his four beasts. And he gives details about what they look like and what they're doing. And then if you stop there, you would probably be very confused. But luckily, Daniel gives us interpretation through the angel. It says this in verse 15. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions had passed through the mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of this, an angel. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saint and the most high will receive the kingdom that will possess it forever and ever, the kingdom of God. All right, and that's kind of all we want to talk about there. Just a quick one also, then go to verse 23. It says kind of the same thing. Gave me the explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. So we read about these funny creatures, these animals coming out and how they look. And Daniel tells us what they are. And what are they? Kingdoms. All right. So thank you, Daniel, for explaining what they are. Thank you, John, for explaining what your uh, beasts are in Revelation 13 too. All right. So as I said, people are quick to look at the Bible and just jump on their little bandwagon and force their own opinions in. You don't have to do that because most of prophecies in the Bible are actually interpreted by the prophet themselves. All right. So we know now what the beasts are. We know their kingdoms. The question is, what kingdoms are they? Are they Canada? Why not? Are they America? Yeah. South Africa. They've got to be South Africa. We've got to be there somewhere. I think from the rapture, What beast could be South Africa? Oh, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so we understand that. The Bible tells us what these images are. It tells us the interpretation. They are kingdoms. So, so far we're on the same page. It's not that difficult after all, isn't it? Now the question is, okay, what kingdoms are they? So now we go to Daniel chapter 2. And then Daniel chapter 2 actually explains again where these kingdoms actually begin. All right, so let's go to our lesson at hand. This 
buddy here that's standing high and tall. The image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Next week, we'll have a test just to spell that word. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> fail, fail, fail. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel is called to interpret a dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. If you want to underline Babylon, write there modern day Iraq. Babylon, the city where Nebuchadnezzar ruled from, is actually the ruins found today not far from Baghdad in Iraq. They've actually rebuilt some of the ruins already. Um, during the reign of Saddam Hussein, I don't know if you remember that dude from the Gulf War, or I don't know, somewhere around that area, uh, he, he was uh, responsible for rebuilding much of Babylon. And please go look at it on the internet. Um, just type in um, ancient Babylon, Baghdad or whatever, and it should give you some lovely pictures. It's actually a museum now where you can go and see some of the ancient works, even the gate, the ancient Babylonian gate at there. So that's... They, oh, is it? Wow, all right. Nice to see also. I don't know if you know. Yeah, there's some controversy about whether those hanging gardens were actually in Babylon or not. All right, so there we go. A bit about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. It says, Nebuchadnezzar sees a statue made of four metals that is destroyed by stone and a mountain. Daniel explains the statue represents four successive kingdoms, beginning with Babylon, whilst the stone and mountain signify a kingdom established by God. And that will never be destroyed. This is the kingdom of God. Uh, when God comes, we spoke about that, I think, in detail already, about the thousand-year reign of peace where Jesus will come back and set up his own kingdom, a little physical kingdom on earth, and that will reign forever and ever. All right, so we have Daniel's, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of this statue, doesn't know what it's about, and then he calls Daniel in, and then Daniel tells him what the statue actually means and represents. So we'll read a bit from Daniel chapter 2 on your lesson, 31 to 35. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and his form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So you go from the top, it actually goes from majority to minority. The most expensive one in, uh, in the day was gold, and then it goes to silver, then to bronze, and then to iron. And then right at the bottom, his feet is made of a mixture of iron and clay. All right, so if you read that again, you'll be a little bit confused as to what is going on. What is this image about? But again, Daniel actually tells us what it's about. So if you're still at your Bible, before you even turn the page, um, go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is an awesome book. I think I must do a sermon series just on Daniel. Such an amazing book. That's the next study, Daniel. Dun, dun, dun. Um, and believe it or not, I'm trying to find the verse. We can start by 36. Yes, yeah, yeah, we're going to go to 36 because we've kind of done the dream already. We've read most of that now, 31 to 35. And then in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to start by 36. It says, this was a dream and now we will what? Interpret it to the king. So it's good that we have these images and symbols, but the great thing is that the Bible does actually interpret it. So there's no private interpretation of scripture. It says this, You, O king, are the king of kings, the God of heaven that has given you dominion and power, might and glory. In your hands you have placed mankind and the beasts in the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over all of them. You are that head of gold. Did we get that part? So he's talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, the current king of Babylon. And he says, okay, I'll interpret this image for you, king. Remember the image that had gold and bronze and all of that? He says the top part of that image was gold. And he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, and your kingdom is that head of gold. All right, so that's our starting point. 
We know now that that head of gold represents Babylon. Are you with me? So even on your page next door, you, you'll see not this one here of the image. You'll see at the top, it says, Head, Gold, Babylonian Empire. Do you see that? So at the time Daniel was writing this and receiving this image and this interpretation, the current empire of the world, I say world relatively, it was the known world, which is the Middle Eastern area, was Babylon. And the king of that uh, Babylonian empire was King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the point, that's all he knew. And he knew from this image that there were going to become kingdoms after him. Because that's what he says in, in Daniel. He says, and those other uh, precious metals are the kingdoms that will follow you. You can read the whole chapter in Daniel chapter 7. So we know that he was speaking about Babylon. And then he says, after you, king, there will come another empire inferior to you, and another empire inferior to you, and another one inferior to you. We got that part. The question is, what empires are those? Because Daniel didn't know neither. Because he didn't know. He just knew that there would be. He didn't know what they were. All right. We do. Why? Because we have history on our side. We look back now on, in history books. And we read all about the Babylonian Empire. And then we turn over the page in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Is that right? Britannica. And we turn over and then we see the next kingdom. So we have history to look back on to tell us what those other kingdoms were. All right, so let's look at that image again. And we'll see the first one we know is now the Babylonian Empire. And then it says the one who came after the Babylonian Empire, the Silver Empire, is the Medo-Persian Empire. Do you see that? It's on there. You don't have to even write it. It's right there. So history tells us that the Medes and Persians conquered the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were very... Uh, very powerful. They weren't very big though. They were actually all just around the Iraq Syrian area. All right, but they did have control over Israel because they conquered Israel. We know that. They were taken into exile in Babylon. All right, so they conquered Israel and they, they had uh, control over that area, but majority was still around Iraq, around modern day Iraq. Good question. Persia is modern day what country? No, Iran. Iran, yeah. Persia, ancient name of Iran. And the Medes were around that area also. All right, the Medians. So what actually happened, I'll, if I can uh, give you some insight. Um, the writing on the wall in Daniel. We know that story? Some of us are familiar with God writing on the wall and saying the time is over for you. The Babylonian Empire, because the Persians are waiting outside. That's exactly what the writing said. It said, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Peres, in Aramaic and Hebrew. And that Peres is in reference to the Persians. So even Daniel, at the time of writing that prophecy or that story, knew about the Persians. They were there on the brink. Do you know how the Persians conquered Babylon? History tells us they couldn't reach the walls. That's why the party was going on in, in the writing on the wall. Having this big party, saying, no one can conquer us, they can't get across our walls. Ooh. So they all got drunk and all that, not knowing that there was a river that ran through Babylon. So you know what the Persians done? They just blocked the river off. So they, they, they went upstream, got all their soldiers. Instead of using their soldiers to actually fight any battle, they used them to dig another trench into the river that ran this way. So the river would run and go that way. It wasn't long before the river dried up. And you know how the Persians got in? They walked under the city. They conquered Babylon like that, without even raising a sword. By the time the Persians got in there, the Babylonians didn't know what was happening. They gave up willingly. Can you believe it? That's how the Persians won the battle over the Babylonians. All right, so that's the second empire, the Persian Empire. And then after them, uh, they were eventually conquered by the Greek Empire, and the first emperor of the Greek Empire was who? His name was Alexander the Great. Have you heard of that buddy before? Alexander the Great. Um, he, was, he took over the empire from his father. His father's name was Philip of Macedon. Macedon is the ancient name of Greece. Macedonia. All right. After his father died, young Alexander, at the age of 23, took over the empire. And in 10 years, conquered the world. I take my hat off to Alexander the Great. 
Because in 10 years, he'd done what no other person would have done ever in history. And his empire was great. Compared to the Babylonian Empire, which was relatively constricted just around Iraq and Iran, Persia, his empire went all the way from Greece to India. So he conquered everything. Alexander the Great. So his empire was that belly of thighs and bronze, the Greek empire. He conquered the media Persians. When he died, he didn't leave an heir to his throne, unfortunately. So no one could take over the throne after he died at a young age of 33. He died of a young age of 33, leaving his throne to nobody. So his four generals took control of his empire. His four generals divided his empire up in four, and they continued. But that caused a problem because they weren't running it in unity. They were fighting amongst each other, which always happens. So they divided the empire, they had wars between each other, and eventually crumbled from within. And while they were crumbling, there was an empire there on the banks of the Roman rivers, and that was the Roman Empire. Still a small empire at the time, but it was a republic run by Senate. Julius Caesar, who's done Julius Caesar in school? That's all about the Roman Republic and Julius Caesar and those guys. And then they killed Julius Caesar. And at that time, although they were powerful, they were only powerful in Rome. They didn't have any influence over the rest of the world yet. And then after him, his grand, uh, I think his grandson Augustus became emperor of the Roman Empire. And that's what we read about in the Gospels. Augustus, when Jesus was born, he was the emperor at the time. So Augustus became the emperor of the empire, the Roman Empire, and they finally conquered Greece. They conquered Europe, Greece, Middle East, Egypt. All that area. Yeah, the Roman Empire uh, started just a little bit before BC, about 100 BC, and they continued right through until, anybody knows? Until 500 AD. So that empire at the bottom, that black part, legs of iron, Roman Empire, it continued right through until 500 AD. They were, uh, I say great empire because they were very, they were strategic and military based. They had a great army, a good army, a good in, as in they could fight wars. <laughs> they conquered everything in their path. But eventually what happened, there were the barbarians from north of Europe, the Germanic tribes, they started to infiltrate that empire and destroyed everyone. So about 500 AD, the Roman Empire came to an end. All right. And that was the last empire that the world has ever seen. Empire as in an empire that conquered a lot of area ruled by one person. All right. The Babylonians was an empire that ruled a big land mass ruled by one person. The Persians were the same. The Grecians were the same. Alexander the Great ruled that whole area by himself. It was a huge empire ruled by one person. The Roman Empire was the same. It conquered Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, ruled by the Caesar. And when they were conquered, Europe got dismantled. And tribes started taking different parts and started forming their own little states and countries. And there birthed Italy, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, blah, de blah, de blah. All right. And from that time until today, there's never been a, one person ruling over a big land mass as an empire. That was the last empire in history. Okay. Till the Antichrist comes. Till the Antichrist comes. Yeah. You took the thing out. That was my climax. Come on. <laughs> All right. Till the Antichrist comes. <laughs> Uh, so and, and so we got the Roman Empire. They were and also even the legs. The, the, they say scholars say that the uh, the Roman Empire represents the two legs because the Roman Empire was actually divided into two: the, the Western Empire in Europe and the Eastern Empire in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the Byzantine Empire. All right, so that could be. It, it seems to fit in there. The Iron of Clay. It says that the. Ten divided kingdoms. Um, currently, we, right now, are living at that ankle part. About over here. <laughs> right. uh, so the Roman Empire is finished. We know that. And those ten toes are not there yet. They're still coming. So we're like right there by the big toe. <laughs> right. 
Uh, so what we're waiting for as scholars of prophecy is the ten toes, which will be ten kingdoms united in that same geographical area of the Roman Empire. So what we're waiting for is countries in Europe to unite. Did you hear that? They've been trying for a long time. They've been trying for a long time. Anybody heard of the European Union? Is that not a union? Yeah. No, they still disagree. Yeah, they still disagree. So the idea of the European Union, there will be a union of countries in Europe and the Middle East. They will form ten kingdoms or ten countries in that area. And those ten countries in Europe and the Middle East will be ruled by the Antichrist. Do you see the empire? Large landmass ruled by one person. All right, so that's what we're waiting for. So if you hear, if you hear of anything about 10 countries uniting in Europe, you WhatsApp me, because that, something's going to happen. All right. Not only Europe, it must also include the Middle East. I believe that is what prophecy dictates. There will be 10 countries in the future coming out of that area, in my mind, five from the Middle East, five from Europe. They will be united under the banner of ten countries only, and they will be ruled by the Antichrist. And I get that from that image. You can challenge me, and you can come talk other things, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep the Bible as literal as possible as what it says. Remember, what we mustn't do is take something, for example, like bricks, and force it into the Bible. What we do is we take the Bible, and then we look around and see what fits in with that. Do you understand? So for me, the European Union fits somewhere in there. Not exactly perfectly yet, but it's getting there. All right, to the last page. Ta -da. So before we get there, we got Daniel's vision of the four beasts. What are they? Four kingdoms. All right, we're on the same page. Then we got Daniel chapter 2, the image. And the image represents four kingdoms. All right, and now the last part puts them together. All right. The correlation between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's dream. The first one is the lion with eagle's wings, Daniel 7. The first beast came up from the sea of nations, Daniel 7. Like the image with the head of gold symbolized Babylon. So the lion symbolizes Babylon. Are we on the same page? Head of gold is the lion and they symbolize Babylon. There's just a bit of two cents worth. The next one is the bear, three ribs in his mouth. The second beast with this chest of silver in the image symbolize the Medo-Persian conquest. And above that you can also write Iran, like the lady suggested to us earlier, just for modern day references. The bear's one side was raised, indicating partial strength. The Medes were inferior to the Persians, although united in purpose. The three ribs most likely refer to the Medes and Persians, victory over Lydia, Egypt and Babylon. So that is a little bit of assumption, all right? That's just what we assume could have happened. It doesn't have to be, but it seems like it could be. So there was a bear. Uh, it was strong on one side and weak on the other side. And that is because the Medes were run by a guy called Darius the king, who is in fact the guy that throws Daniel in the lion's den. Do you remember that story? That's the guy we're talking about, King Darius. Um, and then after him, somebody, his son or his uh, son-in-law took over and he was King Cyrus. King Cyrus. And, or Cyrus, um, of the Persians. And that is actually the guy that Isaiah predicts would actually rule. Beautifully enough, Isaiah actually mentions him by name, which is amazing. Isaiah wrote this hundreds of years before Cyrus ever came on, but he mentions that Cyrus the king would rule. All right, so there we have the media Persians. Oh, a quick one for that. Um, I, I told you King Darius put Daniel in the lion's den. All right? And now notice he was from the Persian Empire. When Daniel came to exile, he was in the Babylonian Empire. Okay, you with me so far? He was exiled to Babylon. The Persians conquered him. Daniel still survived and he lived through both empires. The Bible tells us that the Babylonian Empire lasted for 70 years. When Daniel was taken into exile, he was a, a young man around 20 years old. And he lived into the Persian Empire. So how old was he about? What is 20 plus 70? 90. 90 plus years. 
So when we get to the story of Daniel in the lion's den, just from history we understand King Darius was talking to him, and this was 70 years plus already. So he was an old belly when he was thrown in there. That's what I'm trying to say, all right? He was 90, at least five, if not even older than that. All right, interesting, eh? And you would have picked that up if you just read it. All right, the last one, uh, second last one, the leopard with four wings and four heads. The third beast, like a leopard, symbolizes Greece under Alexander the Great, who swiftly like a leopard conquered the then known world. As I said, all the way from Greece to India and south to Egypt. The four wings symbolize double swiftness of conquest, and the four heads represent the four divisions of the Grecian Empire. After Alexander's death, these four generals assumed power over the four regions. So again, we look at history, and then we say, okay, this happened in history. Does it fit in with what Daniel says? And yes, it does. Perfectly. You see? Beautiful. That's why I get excited about Daniel, because uh, it's prophetically 100%. It cannot be um, challenged, history-wise anyway. History actually confirms what Daniel says. All right? And then after that, number four, the last one, is a nondescript, represents the Roman Empire, and the ten horns, a revived Roman European Empire. So those words are very well put there by Dr. Bruce. Uh, revived, because it's going to be in the future, something will happen, it'll be revitalized uh, empire coming, and it will be predominantly around the European continent. European, and actually right above that, Middle East also, please, just for, for me to add my two cents worth. So it's around Europe and the Middle East, because the Roman Empire, if you go look, go, do your due diligence, go look on Google, type in Roman Empire, map. And when it pops up, you'll see it's Western Europe, Middle East, and a bit of North Africa. All right. That's the area where the ten kings will come from. All right. Based on um, the prophecies of Daniel. The little horn, it also talks in Daniel about a little horn. Out of the ten horns comes a little horn. Is in all likelihood corresponds with the role of the Antichrist, who will conquer three of the ten European nations in his quest to seize power, and the ten, tones of the, the ten toes of the image also coincide with the ten horns of the beast. Ten horns, ten toes, ten kingdoms that will come in the future, maybe already in the process of being planned and made. All right. But until that officially happens, only then will this prophecy be fulfilled. All right, so there we've done... We, as I said, we didn't spend too much time on the first one, Revelation 13, because all I wanted that to do was to amplify what those animals represent. We've done Revela uh, Daniel chapter 7, which tells us about these animals. They are kingdoms, historical kingdoms. The image in Daniel 2, the same, four kingdoms. And that's all you have to get out of this lesson. All right, and have you got that? All right, four animals, the image, four kingdoms, starting by Babylon, Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire. And that's it. If you got that, you have got 90% of what many Christians still don't have. All right. And even Christians that have studied this, I spoke to a lady last week, uh, knows the Bible, read it hundreds of times, <laughs> knows about prophecy. Very, very, very proud to say that she knows about prophecy. And then I went through Daniel 10 and, and Daniel chapter 7, and she was shocked to find out that that's what it actually meant. She didn't know that was it, what is it about, and that's what it's about. It's about the four historical kingdoms. All right, any questions? No. Good. Hopefully that means that you've got it.